unskilled uh, males uh, have really not participated very much from technological advances over the past four decades and have in many ways fallen behind in the labor market. And uh, that kind of set up uh, the uh, stage for the realization that uh, technological progress is not always good for everybody. There's two types of stuff. We need policies losers. that encourage work and labor. Um, and then I think you're also arguing something a little different as well, which is maybe we shouldn't even have policies that that um, encourage labor when a lot of labor is going to be displaced, right? What I really propose is that we should introduce the institutions that can distribute a small UBI as quickly as possible because it takes time to build these kinds of institutions. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Randy Shu uh, with the Lohan Academy, and I have the privilege today of hosting um, Professor Anton Koronek. Uh, so Professor no. Koronek is an associate professor at UVA Darden in economics, um, as well as being a Rubenstein Fellow at the Brookings Institution. Uh, so you are also a, uh, I believe, the economics of AI lead at the Center for the Governance of AI. That's so right. Professor Kornick is, um, and um, you know, has become a well-known scholar of the impact of automation and AI on macroeconomics, and in particular on the distributional uh, and labor market impacts. Uh, and then I think sitting near. DC, you're probably also uh, participating in some of the policy uh, discussions going on today. So we're very privileged to have you with us um, today, especially since we're at that zeitgeist uh, with the re recent release of ChatGPT, where people are starting to be really, really worried. I, I guess it's because all the you know, chattering class, professional class like us are now worried that our jobs uh, are, are at risk. So we're, we're certainly very glad to have you with us. And so, Professor Koronek, I was wondering if you can uh, maybe give us, uh, um, uh, you know, get, give us an idea of how you got involved in this type of study. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, I uh, when I started out my career as an economist, I actually studied a completely different topic. I studied macro uh, and finance. And I was interested in particular in financial crisis and what to do about them, how we can regulate the financial sector uh, in a more effective way to avoid the kind of big crisis that we have seen in emerging economies in the 1990s uh, or in a lot of advanced economies in 2008 and the following years. And then around um, 2012-2015, uh, when deep learning really became popular, I started to think, wow, there's really something happening in AI. And this actually brought me back to an earlier interest that I had had before my economics PhD. In the late 1990s, I worked as a programmer I played with neural networks and so on, but back then they really weren't very powerful yet. And in the mid 2010s, I thought, wow, the progress in this field has really been rapid. And I decided to spend uh, some more time thinking about what the implications of that are going to be first for our economy, but second for our society more broadly. And I think, uh, that's ultimately the big question that a lot of us are interested in nowadays. What will be the effects of these ever more capable AI systems on our society? Great. Um, well, you know, you recently uh, presented at Lohan Academy uh, a paper on mm. a kind of the future, you know, uh, the potential future of non-existent work. Um, could could you you know uh, briefly give us a, a you know high level overview of your uh, conclusions from from that paper? Uh, yeah, if I may, I will start with the premise. So, in uh, the conventional wisdom in economics for a long, long time, has been that technological progress 
is always good for everybody, that there may be some short-term disruptions, uh, but that in the long run, uh, as they used to say, a rising tide lifts all boats. Now, that has never been true, uh, but we noticed uh, in uh, a lot of advanced economies in the 2010s that it has not been true in practice uh, either. So in particular, in the 2010s, uh, economists came out with more and more research results that showed that, uh, for example, unskilled uh, males uh, have really not participated very much from technological advances over the past four decades and have in many ways fallen behind in the labor market. And uh, that kind of set up uh, the uh, stage for the realization that uh, technological progress is not always good for everybody uh, when it comes to uh, incomes, when it comes to wages, but that it is possible for progress to actually undermine the livelihoods of certain types of workers. And uh, what I investigate in this paper is well, is it actually possible that technological progress may undermine uh, the demand for all types of labor and may make labor redundant? Okay. And, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, I, I, I was going to, to say that, uh, you know, that has been uh, like a, a very important point, a social and political point. Uh, you know, looking back at the last few decades, um, you know, I think during the the presentation, uh, you got into an exchange with one of our um, committee members, uh, Chris Pisaridis, uh, mm -hmm. who is a, a Nobel Prize winner and also someone involved uh, in this topic, because if, if I recall, he is um, directing a study on the future of work um, in the UK, and he seemed to be. Um, uh, you know, somewhat skeptical of the argument that that humans uh, that there will be uh, you know humans will be replaced or phased out of employment. Um, in particular, you know, he points out that what you know 100 years ago when people started to worry about automation, what they got wrong was the you know the rise of the service industry, for example. And so, I, I guess one question is, why do you think that didn't play out in the the last few decades? Um, or is it something that it is playing out, but it just takes more time? Yeah, you're raising a very uh, good point. And this is indeed a very important debate that's playing out right now in the economics profession. But what I want to suggest is that the difference in thinking between these two camps, so one camp believes that we don't need to worry about any technological innovation because um, ultimately we will always find new jobs for humans. And the other camp believes that at some point uh, machines may actually be able to do everything that humans can do at a cheaper price. So it's a philosophical debate at, uh, ultimately, uh, which of these two camps is correct. And I would say history has been on the side of the first camp. So uh, if we look at the past two centuries, let's say the period since the Industrial Revolution, we have repeatedly automated some jobs and then created new ones. And the new jobs were on average much higher paying than the old jobs. And I think the way to understand it is if you automate half of what I can do, then I can use machines to do that half and I can focus on the other half. And that means in some ways I am twice as productive and you can pay me twice as much ultimately. So that in a nutshell is what has been happening for the past two decades, two centuries, uh, I want to say. And so the big question is, uh, as artificial intelligence advances ever more, will this continue to be true? Or will we experience a situation where AI can actually do everything? Now, um, 
the jury is still out. We don't know, uh, right? Uh, what I suggest in the paper that I was presenting was that it would be imprudent to not at least prepare for the possibility. I think if you look at um, what the human brain does, it is at a fundamental level information processing. It takes in inputs and it produces outputs. So right now, the outputs that we are producing is what we are telling each other. The inputs are what we are hearing and seeing from each other, but we are processing information. And at least conceptually, I think there is no reason that computers cannot engage in the same kind of information processing and that they can't do that at all levels of what we humans are able to do. So you raised chat GPD earlier in our conversation. And in some ways, that has been a very vivid example uh, of how uh, one of the latest AI technologies can automate things that most people thought were impossible to automate just a couple of months ago. And I think conceptually, there is no reason to believe that there are things, that there are cognitive tasks that are exclusive to the human brain. And on that basis, I think we should at least prepare for the eventuality that machines can do everything that humans can do and that they can do it more cheaply. Okay. Um, so, so do you think actually on that question, um, you know, th there's been uh, different things said about chat GPT. Uh, one of which by some people and who's been in AI is that chat GPT is nothing new. It's, it's very incremental. Um, but it certainly has captured public attention. What, what yes. do you think of this moment? Um, so I think yeah, what both, do you personally think? Yeah, both observations are absolutely correct. Uh, I have been playing with the predecessor uh, models of uh, GPT 3.5 uh, for a long time. And it is indeed it's incremental progress. Uh, but it seems that it has just surpassed the threshold where it's suddenly useful for a whole range of tasks. And add a slick surface, uh, a slick user interface to it. And I think that explains why it has suddenly gone so viral. So it's suddenly become useful for a whole range of tasks, even though it has been incremental progress, it has crossed that threshold. And that's why it has captivated public attention so much. Yeah, I, I think someone had asked you about uh, you know, how this affects uh, uh, you know, now playing out in the market. You have Google and, and Microsoft. Uh, there's quite a lot of news about their developments recently. Microsoft is supposedly investing um, money. And I, I think you, you said yeah. that this could cause a sea change in the way um, you know, companies use AI and how we interact with, you know, for example, the Google search engine might be radically changed going forward. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. In some ways, uh, this uh, interface uh, that ChatGPT offers, it's a radically new way for people to interact with computers, for people to interact with something like personal assistance. And people like it. That's why we see so many tweets about ChatGPT, and that's why it has gone so viral. And sure. um I, I guess you and I, we have both uh, read in the news that Google has like rang a code red alert uh, because uh, the popularity of chat GPT uh, has taken them kind of by surprise. And um, they are also very actively working on developing a similar system and making it more broadly available. Sure. Um, what do you think about the predictions that are being uh, thrown out now about timelines? Uh, you know, uh, I, I think a um, former senior person at OpenAI uh, said it was 2029. Maybe it was Ray, Ray Kurzweil also said around the same time frame that uh, machines will be able to do everything humans would. Um, what do you think of those timelines? 
Uh, yeah, so first, especially after all the news uh, that we have seen uh, over the past year, after all these rapid advances, I would not discount people who make such radical predictions. Mm -hmm. I think there is a lot of uncertainty uh, around when we would really be able uh, to automate everything uh, that human brains can do. Um, I also think at some level, the goalposts are constantly moving. And um, uh, the, the final uh, observation I think I would want to make is, I think there is also a distinction between what can be automated and what we want to be automated. So um, even if let's say an AI system can analyze the circumstances of a criminal case as well or better than humans, we will probably still want human judges to make final decisions, at least for some time. Uh, so I think I, I hear a lot of people talking about specific timelines to like one point in history. Uh, when AI will suddenly possess human capabilities. Uh, I think the truth is that we already have systems that can do a lot of things that we humans can do. Like chat GPT probably has more general knowledge than I have. If you ask me about quantum physics, I can't give the same compelling answers that chat GPT can give. Um, <clears throat> At the same time, we humans, uh, at uh, least for now, we have some capabilities that these systems cannot replicate at all. Mm -hmm. So that means uh, in the near term, I think the future is one in which um, we can benefit essentially from gains from trade. We can use those systems for what they are good at and add our kind of human secret sauce to what we are good at. And that will enable anybody who uses these systems, uh, let's say, to help them write their research papers, like in my case, uh, to help them design good interview questions in your case. Uh, it will help us to do what we do better and more efficiently. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the hope. Um, and, and maybe we could backtrack a bit uh, of trying to, um, uh, it, you know, converge on what we even mean by some of this terminology. Um, you know, actually in, in my past life, when I was in college, I, I minored in computer science. Mm -hmm. So uh, everyone um, who takes a computer science class, at, at least I can only speak for, for Harvard, um, but we, uh, we all had to take computer theory. And in computer theory, they, there's a machine called a, or abstract concept called the Turing machine. And everyone's familiar with the Turing, um, you know, the Turing test now, but the Turing machine is essentially a very simple device. Uh, it's, uh, I won't go into it, but it's a like infinite taped, um, uh, you know, read and write head that can just process one character at a time. But the, the, the point of this abstraction is anything that is computable, this simple machine can compute. It just takes forever to do it, but yeah. anything that a modern computer can do. And so, so I think I'm pretty safe saying that I know the limits of what is computable. I know that computers, as far as we know, are not conscious, right? They, they can compute very quickly. They can compute lots of numbers. Um, they can process, you know, statistically what's happening with chat GPT is they can process natural language even. But they're not conscious. So I, I suspect that what will happen, and correct me if you disagree, is that um, you know, computers will, will remain tools beholden to kind of human input. The question I suppose is how many humans you know, do, does it really take to uh, you know, run these machines? Can, and the, the second question is even if it cannot make up for human consciousness and human drive, um, the, the, the question is how, how much of what we do day to day can 
can these machines kind of do, right? How much of what we do day to day can be done and how many humans? And I think that's what's happened with automation in the past, um, which is that potentially there are a group of winners who can use this technology or own this technology and a group of losers. And so I suppose the way I see it at least is this isn't necessarily man versus machine. This is some people with capital or with machine versus other people who may be losers in, in this. What would you think that's a fair assessment? And then I guess the question, if you know, if you do agree with that assessment is everyone says, well, we need policies that, you know, um, uh, you know, th there's two types of stuff. Protect we need policies losers. that encourage work and labor. Um, and then I think you're also arguing something a little different as well, which is maybe we shouldn't even have policies that that um, encourage labor when a lot of labor is going to be displaced, right? So um, I, I think on the first question, a lot of people say this, but I don't know, you know how much is actually being done there. And on the second question, that's actually a, a more novel point uh, going forward. Uh, yeah, there, there were a, a lot of themes uh, in, in your questions now. So let me maybe start with the first one, your observations about computability and Turing machines. I think in, in some ways in the old paradigm of computing, like the paradigm uh, that was probably in many ways uh, the way that... Uh, most of us thought about computing up until the 2010s. Uh, what you said was absolutely right. Computers were something rigid that followed very formulaic approaches and so on. Uh, but then the new paradigm of the 2010s uh, is deep learning. And deep learning is a connectionist approach. It's about uh, what large uh, and deep neural networks can produce. And I think the the amazing thing has been, uh, the amazing discovery has been that these neural networks can solve different kinds of problems than what we use classical computers to work on. Mm -hmm. uh, so neural networks can uh, solve, uh, for, first we used them for, you know, image recognition, sound recognition, uh, but then it turned out they can also better play chess, uh, better play Go than we humans. And they can actually uh, approximate very complex uh, problems sufficiently well to display superhuman uh, capabilities. So that's what, for example, the AlphaGo demonstrated. You can use a deep neural network uh, to solve a problem that is not computable within finite time at a level that is uh, better than any human. Sure. And, uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, and, and so, so based on that, uh, I would say, yes, um, our brains uh, are very different from these traditional computers uh, that we uh, used to approximate with Turing machines. But um, the connectionist framework that underlies deep learning is much closer to the way that our brain operates. And therefore, uh, I think in this new paradigm of deep learning and now foundation models, uh, we have much more reason to be concerned about the future of work. So yeah. in some ways, uh, I think to, to go back to your policy questions, uh, I want to uh, bring an analogy uh, that uh, the famous chess world champion, uh, Gary Kasparov made uh, when, when he uh, talked about uh, the evolution of chess computers. And he observed that for many decades, we used to have chess computers that were yeah, far inferior to grandmasters and certainly inferior uh, to the world chess champion uh, like him. Uh, and then there were a couple of years when there was a genuine struggle uh, when the capabilities of chess computers 
and grandmasters and ultimately the world chess champion yeah. were very close within uh, uh, reach of each other. And a few years later, it was uh, essentially game over in that kind of game and chess computers would beat even the world champion. And that ushered in a period when chess computers together with humans uh, would actually arrive at superior outcomes then only the human or only the chess computer. Yeah, but I, I, I think on the, the chess point, one of the things that really caught the world by, by surprise wasn't that you know they had been working for years and years on better and better chess algorithms and chess computers. It was when they used machine learning to basically use a program that wasn't specifically even programmed by a domain expert, right? Normally we've right. had domain experts. And now we have this general purpose kind of technology, but that kind of goes to my point of, of I feel like even like electricity, you know, economists know, know the example of electricity took decades to implement. So I'm a little skeptical of the 2029 timeframe because even, if even yeah. electricity took that long, I can't imagine this type of, of general, you know, intelligence, um, you know, being implemented yeah. that quickly. But I, I think my, my, my question really, one of my questions really is, um, and I think where we we converge is even if you know this can't replace all humans or human drive or human initiative or consciousness, um, it could replace a lot of humans. And and I always think like if you can snap your finger and say this is the world of the future tomorrow, uh, and none of us need to work, that'd be easier to solve. I think the problem is it seems to me this is going to be a process. And during this process, you're going to have winners and losers. Um, and I know you you proposed one, um, you know, one of your solutions was maybe we could start with a universal basic income kind of now. Um, I, I guess my question is what other policies did you consider, maybe reject? What are the other policies coming online? And, um, and um, you know, what do you think is actually being talked about now or are people still at such an early stage that policymakers are not really having this discussion. Uh, yeah, so so let me first say, I think it would be imprudent to completely rule out that something like this may be happening by, you, you mentioned, you quoted people who say 2029. Okay. I think given how uh, radical of a transformation of our world that would be, we should better be prepared even if we are all quite unsure about what uh, is happening, how long it's going to take uh, until it happens, and so on. Uh, so we should be prepared, even if we prepare too early, just to be safe. Uh, now, in terms of uh, solutions to the problem, uh, so yeah, I think the first uh, realization that a lot of people are having when they are let's say, playing with chat GPD and they realize, hmm, this can do quite a lot of things that I can do. Uh, the first realization is, well, if computers really can do pretty much everything that we can do, and they can do it much faster and much cheaper, uh, then it will no longer be possible for the vast majority of people to survive based on their labor income. And that really calls, and that's the case that I make in, in the paper uh, that we are discussing, uh, that really calls for public policy actions uh, to ensure uh, that uh, the technological advances that we are seeing and that are so amazing really benefit everybody. Uh, so you mentioned one possibility, which would be a universal basic income. Uh, I'll uh, say two things about that. First of all, we don't need a universal basic income right now, today. Uh, and if we were to switch from our current social insurance system to a universal basic income, uh, that would actually hurt a whole range of people. Uh, because the current system that we have is very well targeted at those who need it. And a universal basic income is universal and just distributes to everybody. So that means the neediest would lose a lot. Uh, having said that, what I really propose is that we 
should introduce the institutions that can distribute a small UBI as quickly as possible, because it takes time to build these kinds of institutions. We can't snap our fingers and we suddenly have a UBI if we need it. And we should design it such that it automatically rises and goes up if the labor market prospects of workers decline. So it should be kind of an autopilot as the labor share in the economy, that means as wage incomes across the economy decline, the universal basic income should automatically go up to fill the gap and to make sure that people are not left behind by these phenomenal advances in technology. There's one more thing I want to say about it, which uh, is kind of um, a bit comforting. So if we really have these phenomenal technologies, that means that economic output can suddenly grow much faster than it used to. So if we really have uh, human level like AI systems, uh, the world economy would likely grow much faster even than China has grown uh, for the past two decades. And if we produce so much wealth, if we have so much growth, it should be possible to distribute some part of that extra income to those who are losing from the technological progress, meaning to workers who would no longer have uh, very good prospects in the labor market. Great. Well, I think, um, you know, still have so many questions, but since you ended on a very optimistic note, um, you know, since you mentioned a very optimistic note, I, I think that might be a great one to kind of end on for this time. Um, well, uh, Professor Gornick, I really appreciate your time uh, and your insights. And I think this is something that as you do more work on, we'll certainly be um, in touch with you and following up, I'm, I'm very, very sure. Thank you very much for the interesting conversation. And let's hope that we will all manage to uh, devise a solution to this problem of labor saving technological progress so that we can have both the benefits of, of amazing new technologies and make sure that nobody's left behind. Certainly, certainly. And then at least for, uh, I'll, I'll have in my calendar until 2029, I hope to be safe. <laughs> we will see. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you so much.